Okay, so we're at the end of Revelation. How's it going to end? What are the final verses going to be? And if there's anything I've learned from going through the book of Revelation, God loves people. <laughs> you know, you see all this graphic imagery, all this symbolism, trials, tribulations, and yet you see throughout the entire book, God reaching out to people saying, come on, come on, I want a relationship with you. So it seems so fitting the Bible actually ends with another invitation. It's, it's not just doom and gloom. It's like, come. Come know God. He wants to, to know you. So today we're in the last God-breathed words in Scripture prior to the actual return of Christ. Uh, the Bible's going to come to a close here. It's going to come full circle now. Um, it's a final reminder, of course, that Christ is coming back. We celebrate, of course, on Christmas that he came the first time. But uh, a lot of people were disappointed. It's like, well, he kind of left Rome in place. And he saved us spiritually, but he didn't save us from the government and the craziness and the, the wokeness and the weirdness. It's like, he will. He will. But he's going to come back for that. And so the book ends here with just a reminder, he is coming back. And because he is coming back, you want to know him. You want uh, that in place. So the entire book ends with a final invitation, if you will. In fact, the whole book is kind of a long invitation. It's an invitation to separate ourselves from the perverted progressive politics that have been around almost every century, the PC propaganda, if you will, the pagan pollution of this world, in all its worldly, wicked, wokeness, it's separate yourself from that. That's not your home. You, you don't have to live under the tyranny of the present government, whether you're in Beijing, Russia, or the U.S. There's a whole other kingdom you can be a part of. So get in that world. Accept God's invitation to an eternal banquet into a, a, a whole way of living that's filled with life and love and light and liberty like you don't need you are not destined to be in the land of death the land of divisiveness the land of darkness i know you're living in it now but you're a pilgrim here you're a sojourner you're just passing through the only reason why you're here is we have a higher purpose for you otherwise when you came to know christ god could just beam you up it's like, I accept Christ, good, I got you. And you'd go, but why does he leave us here? Everything's going to be better on the other side. Our fellowship will be better, the food will be better, the, the joy will be better. Why would he leave us in a fallen world of darkness and decay? Because he wants to use us as salt and light here. People are really suffering here. You can know Christ and you suffer. There's still death to deal with. There's still disease to deal with. Some of you are just recovering from sicknesses. You know, like you've experienced the fall just this last week. Um, so, well, why would you leave us in this land? Because people still don't know God and they need someone to tell them. And you're in that fire station. So you're perfect to tell them. You live on that cul-de-sac. You're perfect to tell those neighbors. You go to that schoolhouse. That would be like the best opportunity. Like you are Christ incarnate for them. So because of that, we can embrace kind of our craziness and just go, well, we have a purpose here. Now, as this book ends, as the canon comes to a close, it reminds you and I who already know Christ to be ready. Live with readiness. It says to non-believers, repent. You've got to be ready by getting it right with God. So it's time to repent or to choose or to invite Christ in. Now through this passage as we read it, it looks to me like there's several incentives to embracing Christ. In fact, I think four different incentives seem to be implied in these final verses. One is you want to accept Christ if you haven't already because the Lord himself is inviting you to have a relationship with him. He's so personal. At the very end here, Jesus himself says, come on, people. <laughs> I want a relationship with you. And that alone should be incentive. It's not like he just has an angel say it. Uh, he, he wants it himself. He's like, uh, 
getting very, very personal. That's kind of an incentive. He also reminds people in these final verses that I know we live in a relativistic world that, I don't know, they don't think anything is true, <laughs> anything's right, that's your reality, that's not my reality. But here at the end, he's like, come on people, that's not how it is. You're either part of the light or you're part of the darkness. Bottom line, you're either in or you're out. And he's going to use that language here that if you don't know Christ, you're going to be out at the end. And so there is an invitation like, come on. Like, I know that may seem real binary, <laughs> but <laughs> it's reality. So there is a sense of maybe the exclusiveness of heaven is an incentive to like choose him. He also seems to imply in this final verse here, these final verses, the truthfulness of scripture. If you are tired of living in a world under Roman Empire, uh, Roman Caesars, or Egyptian pharaohs, or whatever country you live in with whatever leadership you have, and you feel like they lie to you, Anyone feel that way? Like they just don't even tell you the truth? Like you can't even trust them? That's been true in every country in every century. I know Americans are a little shocked because we're like, we have a, a sense of our exceptionalism and that this is the land of liberty and the home of the brave and you know that our government would never do that, but our government's filled with fallen, broken people who need the Lord too. And so in these final verses, there seems to be an appeal to if you want truth, something you can rely on, then come to Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life. If you're tired of living in a land of fake news and deception, there seems to be like, well then come to the Lord. And then finally, there just seems to be an emphasis that he is returning. The certainty of his return is enough to say, is that any incentive? Like come to the Lord because I'm coming back. All that seems to be implied of the passage. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up and let's read. We're in Revelation 22, starting in verse 13, and we'll finish out in verse 21, the final verse of the entire canon. So let's read it and then we'll do as we, is our habit. We'll just unpack it together. Here's what Jesus says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And then, of course, let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who's thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll, of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll or book. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll and book. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. There you have it. Amen. Amen.
<laughs> okay, so let's unpack it. What happens here in verse 13? Well, I think he gives a, an incentive here to say, if for some reason you haven't invited Christ into your life, this is a personal invitation from Jesus himself. If, if that's any like incentive for you. It's very, very personal. And he gives a little bit of his credentials. He's like, look, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Remember in the first century, what did they speak primarily? Mostly Greek. And so he uses the Greek alphabet and says, I'm the A and the Z. Omega is the last letter. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Eta, Zeta, I am, Omicron, Pyro, Sigma, Tau, you know, you get all the way to the van. Uh, Omicron, right? Uh, omega. So uh, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z, if you will. He clarifies that. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. In other words, I'm the opening of the story. I'm also the conclusion of the story. In the great race of life, I'm the starting line. I'm also the finish line, which is where we're at. So I'm the beginning source of all things. I'm the end goal of all things. In other words, I am the infinite, eternal, boundless one that transcends all limitations. So if you're like, well, why should I accept Christ? Because he is like the whole enchilada. Like he's everything you would want. And these three terms, by the way, these three descriptions describe the completeness and the timelessness and the sovereignty and authority of Christ. And so it's, it's very personal. He's saying, look, <laughs> I'm like the whole thing. You were created to live out a drama and a story and you're part of a bigger story and I'm the author of the beginning and the end of that story. And so please come into that relationship. These terms also obviously imply, which you know, but I don't mind reminding you, that he's God. These are deity titles. In other words, Jesus is not just some created being. He's not just some great prophet. He's not just some inspiring moral teacher. He's not just some misguided martyr. He is the, the son of God. He's the second member of the Trinity. And he's like inviting us into a relationship. He's the source of salvation. And we've seen this all throughout the Old Testament to the New. Whether it's the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, he's like, he's the ark. Jesus is the ark. You're going to get drowned in the world if you don't get on board with God. That was the metaphor there. He's the kingsman redeemer, if you will, in the story. He's the Passover lamb, the one who saves you from the death of the world. Um, Jesus is the source of salvation. To be saved is to be saved by Christ. To be a Christian is to be in Christ. To be forgiven is to be forgiven by Christ. To hope is to hope in Christ. So he's like, I'm like everything you could want. To live is Christ. Um, so I think he starts out in verse 13 by being very, very personal. You're tracking with who I am. I'm like there's nothing more. There's no one else who has what I have. Verse 14, he reminds them that you again may grow up in a world that doesn't believe in truth or absolutes, but there's truth and lies. You're either in or out. And he says blessed, meaning happy, are those who wash their robes that they may have the right or the power or the authority to eat from the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. This is an interesting kind of metaphor, but those who wash their robes, he's saying, I, I want clean people. I want people who are cleansed. I don't want dirty people, filthy people, scoundrels. You know, I told you about my basketball game last night. You know, one of the players yelled a colorful F word, you know, for everyone in the gym to hear. And he was shocked. I went, you need a little time, little little tea, you know. We we don't, that's not, this is an NCAA basketball game. We don't do that kind of filth here. You can do that in the alley, you can do that in your home, but you don't do it on my court, not when I'm on the game. 
Jesus says, if you're going to be like, you've got to be cleansed. Now, are any of us really clean? No. <laughs> are any of us like pure to the core? No. We're filthy. We're terrible. We're like sheep that go astray. So we're cleansed only in Christ. And that's why we have him. It's like, he's like, okay, you, I will exchange your filthiness for the robes of my righteousness. That's why we ask Christ. And he's saying, look, if you want to get in the eternal state, you have to clean your robes. And you're not going to do that on your own, no matter how noble of a life you live. You have to have Christ. And otherwise you're going to be outside. We're talking about eternal life. This is not like a city like Portland or L.A. or Atlanta where there's graffiti and rats and homeless people. This is like the eternal state. So blessed are those who have this sense of cleansing. They're going to eat from the tree of life. They're the ones who get to go into the gates of the city. They're the insiders. And if you don't have that, you're going to be an outsider. Because in scripture, he kind of says, look, there is right and wrong. There is good and bad. There is truth and uh, falsehood. There is orthodoxy and there is heresy. I was just reading about someone who's running for office in Georgia and he has some pastoral credentials. But I was following up on some of his beliefs. I'm like, they're just heresy. I don't know how to say it more tactfully. It's just outright wrong. It's just craziness. Like you're free to believe whatever you want to believe, but that's not orthodox Christianity. It's, it's falsehood. It's, it's craziness. It's fables. And here Jesus seems to imply, look, you may have your relativistic woke beliefs, you know, that everyone's kind of cool how they are. That's not how it is in the eternal state. You, you got to be clean. You can't be filthy. And you're not going to be clean on your own. So you're going to need Christ. You need someone to pay for your sin. Otherwise, you're going to be an outsider. Look at verse 15. Outside, that's outside the city, outside the New Jerusalem, outside of heaven, for good, I mean for all time, are the dogs. What were dogs in the ancient world? They're evil people. Uh, the, these are not like domesticated uh, household pets that, <laughs> that he's referring to. Dogs were despised scavengers in the first century that would go about the ancient city garbage dumps. They're basically, it's a synonym for people of low character. Um, there's a lot of people. You can just turn on any news channel you want tonight and you'll see a lot of dogs. They're just terrible. They just lie. They're deceptive. They're filthy. They have terrible habits. They don't have Christ. Look, I'm not pointing the finger like, oh, I'm holier than, than you. I, I have my own fallenness and my own brokenness, but I have God. Praise God. I mean, because otherwise we'd all be outside. But he said, uh, you, you want to be an insider, then you need Christ. You want to get on the boat. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. Um, otherwise, you're going to be outside with the dogs. And who are those people? Those who practice, it's translated here in the New American Standard, New International Version, magic arts or sorcery, but the Greek word is pharmakos. What word do we get from that? So, you know, these are people who practice kind of sorcery or witchcraft, but it's really known for people who use drugs, people who have mind-altering experiences basically those who guzzle what the world has all the weirdness but they're not intoxicated with god you know they're not sober in uh, in christ they they practice the latest greatest new age whatever those people are going to be outside uh, the sexually immoral this is the greek word pornos we get pornography from it, but it's any kind of immoral sexual behavior, and that's like a, a practice, a regular part of their life that they're not going to be in the eternal city. The murderers, these are the people that want to cancel you, deplatform you, take you out, eliminate you, kill you, push for abortion. Uh, th these are people who don't want you around. Uh, these are people who are willing to persecute you. Uh, these murderers, they're not going to be in the eternal state. Uh, the idolaters, uh, these are people who 
have something other than God that's their preoccupation. So it could be climate change, it could be the rainbow uh, ideology of the day, it could be whatever globalism, you know, this the newest, coolest thing that they give their life to, that's not God. Idolaters, it could be youth sports, could be golf, could be money, could be anything that you put above God. He does not tolerate second. It's not like, well, you're a priority. You're not my top priority, but you're part of my, my portfolio. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not going to work. Uh, people that are idolaters, they're going to be out. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood, that's lying, uh, fake news, deception. Anyone that you see that just outright lies to you, they're not going to be in the kingdom of God. I don't care what church they go to. I don't care what they say they believe. That's just not a characteristic of regenerate people. Um, I'm not talking about a white lie or sometimes they kind of got off. I'm talking about a chronic, regular, like they just live a deceptive life. They have an ideology. They have a, a spin to things. He's like, that's not going to be part of the eternal state. Now, when I was reading this, I don't know about you, but verse 15 did catch me off guard a little bit because I know we're wrapping up uh, the entire canon. So I didn't really expect personally. I just thought he's going to go, I'm coming back and it's going to be awesome. Like keep, you know, keep the, <laughs> which he does do some of that, but he's also, he warns here. He's like, we're at the very end. He's like, just so I'm clear, I don't play games in the end. Just so I'm clear, you continue to prioritize something else other than me. You're not in. And if you're a liar and you're deceptive and you, you, you just do crazy crap like that, no. I, I don't care if you have a fish sticker on your car or how many times you go to church. You're not going to be in. So I'm like, wow, it's a little stronger than I anticipated at the very end here. And, and he gives a little bit of a list here. There are, all of us can be murderous, right? I mean, given the situation and you're on a de little depleted and... You're out in the country and no one's around and you have someone that irritates you. There's probably part of you in your own sinful nature that's like, I could just take him out. That was, <laughs> I don't know. I could be just speaking to, <laughs> no one else can relate to that. Come on. <laughs> but thinking it, it reminds us like, okay, we need a savior because we are murderous to the core. Um, but I'm not talking about people who think it and fantasize it. He's like, these people do it. That's what they live. They take people out. They're eager to take, and there's a lot of ways to take people out without using a gun or a knife. And there are just people like that. And he's like, that's not going to, and that's fine. Pass your marijuana laws and, you know, cocaine. It's no big deal. And it's just, we're just partying and we're just trying to take the edge off. That's fine. But if pharmacos is a regular part of your life, you're not, like, I, I don't know who you're fooling. That, that's not going to fly. Be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. Don't get drunk with wine we're talking wine. I'm not talking cocaine, marijuana, you know, fentanyl. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Look, I want you to be spirited. I want you to be animated with God. But not some other substance. That doesn't mean you can't have a, I don't know, a, um, what's a good drink we could have during the holidays? Come on. Wine. I'm thinking, what is that? Oh, Moscow Mule? Come on, people. That could be nice, right? It's, he's not saying, look, you can't have a holiday drink or have a nice night out and cheers or something. But he's like, if you use substances or alcohol to fill your, to anesthetize, um, instead of coming to me, that's not going to fly in the end. So anyways, I thought it was a little like, wow, okay, there's, there's more. Anyways, let's keep going. Verse 16. Here, he gets interestingly specific. I, Jesus, <laughs> I'm like, okay. I, Jesus, have sent 
my angel to give you this testimony, this witness for the churches, and I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So here he says, look, the angel is the messenger that I'm sending to you, but it's coming from me. <laughs> this is like the king putting his stamp, like I'm authenticating, like I want you to know this is specific from me, even though I'm sending a messenger to tell you this. And I want you to know I'm both the root and the offspring of David. This is two messianic titles, but he's like, I'm the perfect God-man. Like, how is that possible? How can you be David's ancestor, but also David's descendant? Well, because he's the God-man. This is clearly a, a, a reference to his two natures, that he's fully God and fully man, both achieved in this, and he's the bright morning star. That's like when you get up in the morning and there's that one star that you know still twinkles in the morning light, the one that ushers in like the dawn of a new day. He's like, that's me. This whole new era, this whole new eternal state that I'm preparing, that's me. Super cool. Now here's your invitation, verse 17, embedded in these verses. Two invitations, by the way. First one is here, the Spirit and the Bride. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Who's the Bride? The Church, right? The Church is the Bride. So the Holy Spirit and the Church of God say, Jesus, come. <laughs> like, we've been tearing on for a long time. I mean, some of you are already thinking like the Holy Land might be Tennessee, Texas, or Idaho. It's like, I get it. Or maybe Arizona, right? It's like, it's, it's just crazy living here. But this is even better than those states, right? This is like the eternal state. So there's a sense of like, I want to move. I do too. Like we all want a better country, a better land. And the eternal state is that. So there is a sense of the church going, Anytime, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Be really, I don't even think there's taxes in the eternal state. So I'm like, so, like, come, 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 come. So that's the first invitation. But then there's a second invitation. Let the one who hears, that is really the person who's a non believer who hasn't quite heeded the words of Christ, let him also say, come. And how do I know that? Because he clarifies it. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes or wants or desires to take the free gift of the water of life. They've never done that yet. Let that person also come. So there's like two invitations here. Jesus, we are so ready as your church along with the Holy Spirit. Like, come on, <laughs> like bring it. <laughs> But there's also, if you don't know Christ, this is the last invitation of all scripture. And for you who don't know him, tell Jesus to come. You who are thirsty, you've been guzzling everything the world has for you and you're still parched. You got a nice home, you got a white picket fence, you got a good education, and you're still like, it's not doing it. You know, you've climbed the ladder of success and it's like, it's still not totally fulfilling. Like, there's got to be something more. You who are thirsty for something that's more nourishing than anything the world could provide, more fulfilling, better than a Coke, more refreshing. Um, he says, if, if you're thirsty, if you hunger and thirst, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, for righteousness, if you hunger and thirst for God, if that's important to you, come to me because if you drink of him, right, you'll never thirst again. He has a, a water, an eternal kind of water that always satisfies. And if you're out there and you're just, you wish or you want or you desire that free gift of the water of life, it's free. Not because it's like free, free. It's been paid for. It's just fully paid for. This is already covered. This is a vacation that's already fully paid for. Like you got to like if you have the golden ticket, like it, it's all included. And you want that, you wish for that, you desire that. Even here in these final verses of the canon, he's like, 
then do it. Do it. it it's, it's free. So we see uh, this sense of Jesus, we want you to come, but also a final invitation to non-believers. If you're thinking about it, tell Jesus to come. Invite him in. And then finally, in verse 18, well, not finally, but we have another incentive, and that is just if you're tired of all the lies and stuff and you want more truth, at least the truthfulness of Scripture, and we are, you guys are lovers of God's Word. I love that. You cherish God's truth. You delight in the Lord's laws, His precepts, His ordinances, His statutes, His promises, which is so cool. It's fun to journey with you. But here's a final warning in verse 18, I warn you, I testify to everyone, I'm giving you, he's like, this is fair warning. Be warned. If you hear the words of this prophecy or of this scroll or of this book, if you will, today, if you hear this and then you reject it in some way by maybe adding something to it, maybe something of your own or some other scripture or something, or you want to take away from it, that's a problem. I've said what I want to say, and that's it. It's my word, not your word, that matters in the end. Look how he kind of unpacks it here. If anyone adds anything to this revelation, God will add to that person the plagues, the disasters, all the things you saw during the tribulation described in this scroll in this book. And then if anyone takes any words away, like you subtract any part of this prophecy, because it's not convenient, or you don't like how it sounds, or it's just not you, and you want to do you. Um, well, you do that, God will take away from that person any share or any part in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the scroll in this prophecy in this Bible. So this is a clear final closing comment as the canon's coming to a close in the first century and God is done with his written revelation, a warning that this is going to be a closed canon. I don't want anything added or taken away. And people have been doing that. And he's, that's like the final warning here. And by the way, I don't think it's just revelation. I think it is the entire canon. I'll give you an example. I don't have time to unpack it fully, but I'll give you a quick example from Moses. Deuteronomy 4.2. That's way back in the Pentateuch. That's at the very beginning. Moses says, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And later in Deuteronomy 12.32, he says, Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add or take away from it. I share that with you just so you know the language here in Revelation has already been used before. Moses used it at the beginning, he's using it at the end, so I do think this is a more expansive text here. He's not only saying don't add to the book of Revelation in this Revelation, but you're not to add to anything in Scripture or take away from anything. That's been going on from Moses all the way now to the Apostle John. And has that been happening? Yes. There are false prophets, frauds, charlatans in our town that have added and taken away. They're everywhere. In the first century, the Montanists in the early church were adding all kinds of stuff. Uh, Joseph Smith, the LDS Mormon founder, has added all kinds of doctrines of Pearl of Great Price and Doctrines and Covenants and the Book of Mormon. These are all additions that this scripture clearly rebukes. Mary Baker Eddy with Christian Scientist has added to the text. All false prophets add their own things. Even the Catholic Church is somewhat added. It's not only the Bible, but it is like the Pope's word. And it's like, these are additions that I would caution anyone. I think this text is cautioning us. Don't add to the text of God. And it also says, don't subtract from it. Uh, Marcion did that in the early church. 
Uh, liberal higher critics have done that in the 18th, 19th century, trying to remove the deity of Christ, trying to remove the authenticity of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture. Today, we see it all the time. Today, you just see it in the liberal church. They're taking away the authenticity of the scriptures and moving into all kinds of weird stuff. Communion isn't even communion. It's like a Jesus snack. I have no idea like how anyone would like support that. Who wants a Jesus snack? I'm like, that's crazy. They're flying rainbow flags and, and changing all kinds of things about manhood and womanhood and genderedness. And it's like, I would not like change God's definition of marriage at all. You subtract from that and then you add your own stuff. Like this is exactly what he's closing out the canon with. Like be warned. I've spoken. I don't want to be misquoted. Jesus is super clear here. Now for you and I, I'm going to be candid with you. It's, I, I journey with really thoughtful people typically and you do too. So most of us would never be audacious enough to go, well, I'm going to take that book out of the Bible. Or I'm going to add the, the book of Dave. It's a really cool book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> most of us aren't like that crazy. But there are ways to alter God's word. I'll give you a few that just came to my mind this week. Is just disobeying God's word is a way to take away from it. Just going, I'm not going to do that. I, it, I'm not talking about like you like going, I don't like the book of James and I'm taking that one out. Or but Most people we journey with never do that. But subtly, they might be, that's just like tithing. No, that one's out. Or this, that's out. Or helping the, the home, like that one's. There are ways just to like subtly diminish the word by disobeying it or disregarding it, just kind of ignoring it, or maybe just distorting it, um, because just, I don't know if God wants me to suffer like that. It's like, be careful, diluting it, just diluting the text, like he says it, and it's like, well, he, the gist, you know, just the gist of it is, I get it. Um, just deflecting from God's word. So I, I just mentioned that to say that's what I'm working on myself. I'm not going to come up with some crazy addition to the scriptures and I'm certainly not going to take any of the books out. But I might do subtle things in my own head that don't give the scriptures the full weight that they deserve, which is you said it, I'm doing it. And I don't even know how I'm going to do some of the things in there. I can't do some of the things in there. I'm going to need your spirit to do it. <laughs> and I'm going to have to, you're going to have to change my attitude because I don't even like that scripture or that one's not like, I, I, I don't even lean that way. But it's like, that's not the point. We come to submit to God and his word. And it's like, if you say it, then I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to need your spirit to do it. I'm not even sure I'm going to like it. But that is the point. We're aligning us with his word. Anyways, so today we continue to read the Bible, teach the Bible, believe the Bible, guard the Bible, love the Bible, obey the Bible, because the Bible includes the joys of heaven and the terrors of hell. Both are talked about in the scripture. And you have to have Christ. And uh, thankful, I'm thankful for you personally because you give me the time and the energy and the livelihood to invest in handling accurately the word of truth. None of you come here because you just want a little motivational talk or just a, a small little devotional word that'll be like a bumper sticker that'll make you feel good during the day. You come because you're like, Dave, exegete the word. Handle it accurately. Even if you don't like it or it's hard, you submit to it. We're going to try to submit to it. Let's like get the context right. Give us the history of it. Like, But let's just go through the word. Let's let God speak. We're here to hear him speak. And he has spoken. And now we're down to our final few verses of the canon. Um, and I think this is kind of like a benediction at the end. Uh, a benediction comes from the Latin bene, well, and dicere means to say, and a benediction is to 
say something well, to give a good word. Uh, sometimes in the old day, the pastor would be now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling. May God, da da da, you know, or, you know, go in peace, my, my brothers and sisters. Grace and peace to you. God be with you. Uh, a benediction is kind of like a final send off good word, blessing, if you will, called the benediction. I think that's what we have here in verse 20. It says, He, that is Jesus, who testifies to these things says, and here's his final words, yes, I am coming soon. I'm coming back. John, you're exiled on the island of Patmos and you may be a little overwhelmed with the Roman oppression there. I'm coming back. Uh, for those of us who live here, today and you feel like uh, the world's just spinning in a way that you don't like, hang on, he's coming back. Uh, one, if you live your full life before he comes back, it's not that long. You're not guaranteed, like you even have another day, week, month, or year. So live with a sense of urgency, but you may not even live your full life because he could return any time. Of course, particularly in this day and age. <laughs> Israel's already back in place. Globalism is going. There's a lot of things in place right now. Um, so Jesus says, I'm, I'm coming soon. And then you hear kind of a, uh, a simple amen. Uh, amen is Hebrew for so be it. It's like uh, to support or confirm or uphold or something. So it's like Jesus says, yes, I'm coming soon. And then there's this amen. Let it be. <laughs> Let's go. Um, and then kind of a personal prayer, I think, of John sneaks in there. Uh, he uses the, the word Maranatha, which just means, come, Lord Jesus. I, I, it's almost like he seems to mutter this under his breath. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. And it's like, come, Lord Jesus, <laughs> like, do it. <laughs> like, make my day. That sounds so good. Um, and then your final verse. Um, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all God's people. Amen. Oh, yes. So these final verses are written, obviously, the church was in a very difficult time in Christian history. The emperor Domitian, I don't mind reminding you, had claimed that he was Lord and he was God and Christians were not going to worship him and they weren't giving all the offerings that he wanted. They weren't part of the PC government <laughs> mandates of the day and it was difficult. They were getting persecuted. Um, it was hard to hang in there. Hard to hold on to your faith and your hope and your love when you're persecuted. Uh, they were, you know, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you don't do what the government says, you can't go to the colleges, you can't travel, you can't buy things like you want. Uh, you, you, you know, your kids are going to see you suffer. You know, you're going to get locked up. Whatever, whatever's happening in Russia today or China today or here today, go back to the first century. It was brutal. And in the midst of all that governmental difficulty, Jesus says to John and to you and me, I'm coming back. It may be rough for a while, but I'm coming back. Don't succumb to the fear. Don't deny the source of eternal life. Don't exchange your eternal future for some temporary gain to try to win some emperor's approval or some pharaoh or whatever you think the IRS is telling you you have to do, or your workplace is saying, you can't do that here. Don't give up who you are for something temporal to please some job. Stand tall. Maintain your faith. Affirm your walk with God and remain true. I think he's trying to say, don't lose heart, stay faithful, you will be vindicated soon. So in closing, I think to those who are lonely and lost, um, Jesus seems to say in this passage, come. Come to him. Eternal life is a free gift. You can experience a peace that surpasses all comprehension. 
you'll be forgiven. You don't have to live in guilt. If you're tired of trying to do it on your own, come. For those who are a little bit indifferent and apathetic um, towards the things of God, it does seem in this passage, he seems to be saying something like, wake up. <laughs> if you're not in, you're out. And you want to be in, you're going to have to make a choice. Choices have eternal consequences. And I'm honoring your free will. As adults, you have honor and dignity. You're free to choose whatever you want. But be warned, if you're a little bit indifferent or on the fence or you haven't like quite figured that out, I think this passage is kind of like, wake up. Like, just so you're tracking. I'm not messing here. Um, and then I think to those who are just maybe a little bit anxious or fearful or it's just kind of rough right now for you, you're just having a hard time, you love God, I think it ends with grace be with you. Um, that's a way of just saying, just know that the Lord is sovereign. He's going to finish it in the end. Keep trusting Him. Uh, in this particular passage, He tries to say, remember I'm like the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. I, I'm the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. I, I know it is stressful living in a fallen world. It is super stressful. But I'm sovereign. I'm in control. I got you. Hang in there. So today... A final invitation for the Holy Spirit and for the church the invitation is Lord whenever you want to come back like, come <laughs> like we can't wait who needs Tennessee you know when we can have the eternal state you know <laughs> who needs Arizona or, or Texas or Idaho I mean we already feel that right we feel that it's like yeah but the eternal state is what we really long for well, that's what we really long for so Lord Jesus come but a final invitation, a second one too, and that is to all of those who just for whatever reason just haven't come. If you're thirsty and you're hungry for something with more substance, something more eternal, you want to be inside and not outside, tell Jesus, come. Invite him into your heart. Receive him, like today. The book ends with an invitation. Amen? Amen.